Uh, we are joined today by uh, Professor Mohammed Dajani Daoudi, who um, for a while was with Al Quds University, but now is the founder of the Wasatia movement, um, or, uh, which is a, a moderate, as I understand it, a moderate Muslim what are you looking for? initiative. Um, and um, and Yossi Klein Halevi, with whom I was connected by a mutual friend, who is a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, but also interestingly works with a colleague at Duke University called Abdullah Antepli, uh, where they're engaging Muslim American, emerging Muslim American leaders <clears throat> in uh, teaching them about Judaism, Judaism Jewish identity and, uh, and Israel. Um, I've, asked, um, I've asked them, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing Mohammed yeah. or I'm seeing Stephanie Kukuru. I'm seeing I'm not on my speaker view, so perhaps I'm not sure how that how that worked. But, but, but I've asked uh, Yossi and Mohammed. Could, could I trouble everyone to mute themselves, <laughs> or could Charles? Could you mute everyone and then Yossi and uh, Mohammed please unmute yourselves? Uh, and I've asked them both. To I asked him to, to uh, talk about some of the key experiences along the way that resulted in his book, basically an opportunity to introduce himself and the, and the narrative that, uh, that he's offering. And likewise, Muhammad if, Muhammad, if you would tell us something of your own journey and any key experiences along the way that you've had that led you to respond to Yus's book, again, an opportunity to introduce the, the Palestinian narrative as well. So over to you two to, to have a conversation with each other, which is going to be the main thing this morning, which I've got some prompts, which you've both seen, and when uh, when necessary, I'll jump in and offer them. So, uh, Yossi and Mohammed. Well, uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to have a conversation with my friend and neighbor, Mohammed, uh, who I don't see nearly uh, often enough. And uh, sometimes it seems that we meet on Zoom more than we meet uh, in person. And uh, Mohammed, uh, how are you? How are you uh, this afternoon? Fine, uh, thank you. And um, I, I, I think I would just like to pick up uh, where where uh, where you left off, Reverend, and that is um, I, Mohammed. What maybe we should begin to say something about our stories and how we got to this point. Of being friends and 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 sharing a similar vision with with some with some differences. There are of course differences in how we see and how we see things, but uh, we share, I think, uh, more than we disagree about. And um, but we come at it from such different places, and maybe that would be of interest. Would you Would you do the honor of uh, beginning? I'd like to hear you first. <laughs> well, well, if you... Uh, you started the book and then I responded. So okay. we have to follow the same sequence. Okay, okay. So um, I, I would begin my story in the late 1990s when I went on a journey uh, into, um, into Palestinian society as an Israeli, as, an, as a religious Israeli Jew, uh, I thought that my connection might be through religion. And so I went on an, a one-year journey into Palestinian Islam and Christianity. And the result of that journey uh, was a book called At the Entrance to the Garden of Eden, uh, which had the misfortune of being published on September 11th, 2001. Um, very few people, uh, as a result of that confluence uh, of dates, uh, very few people actually uh, read the book. Uh, uh, one of those was the, was the former uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, who actually uh, dedicated a, um, uh, I believe it was his Lent sermon, uh, to, uh, uh, to the book, and uh, that's how we, we got to know each other. It was very touching, it was a very moving sermon. And, um, 
And the truth is that by the time the book came out, I had already despaired in the possibility of uh, Palestinian Israeli uh, rapprochement. And that's because the what we call here the Second Intifada had already uh, broken out. And the Second Intifada is seen by Palestinians and Israelis in diametrically uh, opposite uh, ways. Our understanding of what happened in the Second Intifada is, is, is very different. And here, Muhammad and I have one of our, our uh, I think, seminal disagreements about uh, why the Oslo process failed. And I'll tell you my narrative, not to try to uh, convince anyone that it's right, but to try to explain how Israelis understand the conflict today and why most Israelis, including most Israeli liberals, uh, no longer uh, feel guilty about the occupation. And it really dates to the Second Intifada. And in the mainstream Israeli narrative, you can ask nine out of 10 Israeli Jews, uh, why did the Second Intifada break out? Who's responsible for the collapse of Oslo? And you'll get pretty much the same answer. Israel offered a two-state solution. Israel, Israel tried to make peace uh, at Camp David and then accepting the Clinton proposals. And, and Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian leadership uh, opted uh, for four years of suicide bombings because they wouldn't uh, accept the condition for a two-state solution that both Israel and President Clinton presented, which was that Palestinian right of return would be confined to a Palestinian state and would not happen in Israel. And there's no Israeli government left, right, or center that would accept right of return to Israel. And the impact of having Israel having accepted a two-state solution, uh, offering to redivide Jerusalem, and going through the Second Intifada destroyed the Israeli left. The Israeli left was mainstream up until the Second Intifada, and it today is reduced to a very small minority in the Knesset, in the parliament. And again, I'm telling you this, not to say that the Israeli reading of the Second Intifada is right, even though that is my reading as well. But you have to understand why Israelis are so furious at the Palestinian leadership and have no trust in the Palestinian national movement and don't feel that the onus is on them anymore. Now, I personally think we let ourselves off a little too easily with that, even though that is my basic narrative. That doesn't explain the settlements. It doesn't explain uh, um, other Israeli actions. But in terms of how I read this conflict, that's my reading as well. And I'm telling you this also to explain myself. For many years after the Second Intifada, I was out. I said, I, and, and I basically repudiated the book that I wrote, the Garden of Eden book. I wasn't interested in that book. When I would get emails, usually from well-intentioned Christians in the West, uh, usually from mainline churches, uh, who'd read the book, they seemed to be the only people who read the book. Uh, and they would say how moved they were, and it was very, and, and I would respond very warily. You know, well, there are things you don't understand about this conflict. And you think that just because I had some sweet experiences, that means that peace is possible. You know, well, what about, what about the year 2000? That was, my, that was my default position for many years. What ended, what brought me in the end to shift gears and to write my book Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, which was an attempt to renew my connection with Palestinian society after a hiatus of many years. Uh, were a number of, of factors, one of which, a very, very major factor, was that the separation wall uh, was built outside of my, my porch. I, that's my view. I wake up to the wall. Now, I have, a, again, I have a very different reading 
of, uh, of why Israel built that wall and who's responsible ultimately for that wall. But that wall is a daily reminder of our failure, of everyone, what, what I regard as both sides' failure, of, of our diminishment, our human diminishment. And, and the book was born through insomnia. I would sit up uh, late at night, my study is adjacent to my porch, and I look out uh, onto the Shuafat refugee camp, which is just past the wall. And I would see lights on three, four in the morning, lights on the neighbors, in, in neighbors across the way. And I would have these conversations in my head. You know, here we are, we're so close, but we could be on total opposite ends of the planet. And I started writing, dear neighbor, I don't know your name, I don't know anything about you, um, but I'm looking out at, your, at, at the lights in your home, it's four in the morning, I'm waiting for the muezzin, uh, for the pre-dawn prayer, and I feel this intimacy to you, and I want to get to know you, I want to tell you my story, I want to explain how I as an Israeli experience this conflict, and I want to know how you as a Palestinian experience it. And so, I wrote the book and had it translated into Arabic. It was published in Arabic the same day it was published in English. And I put it online for free downloading in Arabic. And I invited Palestinians to respond. And I hired a group of young Palestinians and other Arabic speakers around the Middle East to promote this book in, in social media, in Arabic social media. And I got thousands of downloads and hundreds of letters. And one of the very first letters that I got, one of the most profound responses, and a response that led to a friendship that I cherish, uh, was from Muhammad. And um, I know if I were writing this book today, it would no longer be Dear Neighbor. I have names of, of neighbors, of friends I know people's stories. And that was one of the intentions of this book was to renew my connection. And the last thing I'll say about the book is that um, the next edition that came out a year later in paperback contains an epilogue, letters from Palestinians to their Israeli neighbor. And it's about 50 pages of what I thought were really the most compelling uh, responses that I received from Palestinians. And the difficult choice that I had, and with this I'll, I'll, I'll conclude and really turn, turn this over to you, Muhammad. But the difficult choice that I had, and I don't know if I ever told you this, was um, do I give the Palestinian letter writers the last word in my book, or do I respond to each of the letters? Because many of the letters, including yours, um, challenge me. You challenge my narrative or aspects of my narrative. And that's what I, I invited that response. But I felt, you know, I'm writing a book to explain and defend my people's story. And then I'm going and giving the Palestinian narrative the last word in my own book. And in the end, I decided to do that, first of all, to honor the courage and the goodwill that you and others showed. And also to try to signal that we need a new kind of conversation. We need a conversation that's less defensive. Oh, I have to answer every, every point that, that my Palestinian respondents raised. And I have to say, no, no, that's not true because in 1942, this, and we, we know each other's arguments by heart. Anyone who's been engaged uh, in this conversation uh, for, I've been, I worked as a journalist for many years. I've lived in Israel for 40 years and you could wake me up in the middle of the night, I, I can recite both people's narratives uh, from, from, from memory. But I really wanted a different kind of conversation. And Mohammed, I'm so grateful to you for taking up my, my invitation and for teaching me, teaching me what the next step is in, in this conversation. So thank you. So, 
the uh, Jeffrey, are you going to comment or should I start? No, please go. Please, please go ahead. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ossi. It was very inspiring talk and I appreciate everything you have said. Uh, I'm working on a lecture to my students who are now, to the students who are doing their PhD at the Europa University in Flensburg. And I'm supposed to talk about uh, justice and uh, reconciliation. And um, interestingly enough, uh, the more I explore the concept of justice, the more I get lost because um, the, uh, you know, it is, uh, there is a popular saying that if you want to work for peace, work for justice. But the question is what is justice? And um, here my life is uh, crystal clear uh, divided into uh, two phases. One phase in which I was a radical. Uh, I did not believe in the right of Israel to exist. And I did not believe, and I did not know anything about Jewish history or Jewish culture, and I denied it. Uh, and um, in that, what it is what uh, you may call period one has a heart of stone. And to me, the destruction of Israel was the core of my life. And was, it is, uh, even there came a time when our ideology was, if you can't beat them, destroy the temple over their heads like Samson did. And so, there was a lot of enmity, hatred, hostility, and um, filled with anger uh, for what happened in 1948, uh, blaming everything on the other without making a personal review about where did we fail as Palestinians and what happened. And so this is, uh, between 1967 and 1993, I was not allowed to come to Israel. So to me, I was living in a cave, Plato's cave of ignorance, of uh, images, of misperceptions. And so in 1975, a crucial point in my life allowed me to uh, uh, divorce politics and Get in married, I call it married academia, get involved in the academia. And so I left the cave that I left, was living in Beirut, uh, the Arab world, the uh, what we call the revolutionary world, and went to uh, England first and then to the United States, where I had the opportunity to study, to learn. And so I call it that I was out of the cave. And uh, it helped me to search for truth and for knowledge. And uh, so when the opportunity came for me to come back to Jerusalem after all these years outside, it was very interesting to meet the other and to learn about the other and to talk to the other and to converse with the other. And, uh, to look at the other through my personal experiences, uh, not, at the, not as the enemy, but rather as a human being. Through my experiences with my, with my father first who had cancer and uh, my enemy was helping him heal. And uh, my mother who had uh, um, an asthma attack on uh, on our way back from Tel Aviv and the soldiers at the airport, uh, Ben Gurion airport helped, brought in medical team to help her. So although these are personal stories, yet they influenced me a lot, uh, opened my eyes, inspired me to look around and to see 
were the, were the humanity and the other. Yet, uh, it was very hard to, any, within this, any uh, awakening, or what I would call awakening, and later came Yossi's book. Had it come in my first period, first, I would not have read it. Second, I would not have responded to it. And third, I would have said to him simply, we are right, you are wrong. We are the victims, you are the aggressor. And so it was a clear cut vision of uh, what life is. But having, been, having gone through a transformative experience that have changed my views, not only the personal one, but also on the national one. I believe that there are many stories on the national level that where there is cooperation between Palestinians, Israelis, where there is uh, help and where is there, where there are people who extended their hands to the other. And we started to look to see that when we used to label Israel as Israel, it included all types of people, but we saw them one, Israel. But now, once you are within the, within the system, within the country, within, and there is a dialogue there, then you see that there are within Israel, as within Palestine, the extremists and the moderates, those who are for peace, those who are for uh, uh, conflict and for, ex for extension of what I call the big dream, small hope. And, uh, in the sense of the big dream, those who want to have it all from river to sea, to have an, a Jewish state uh, with Jerusalem as the capital, with the temple replacing everything, and with the Palestinian also big dream of uh, Palestine from river to sea without the other. And so this is where this vision of either us or them, when you shift to the vision of us and them, then you see a book like uh, Yossi's book, then you will be interested to read because you say this is, for, this is one of the few times that the other is, is sending this message and he threw the wall because you look at the wall which does not separate between Israelis and Palestinians, but mainly separates between Palestinian and Palestinian, Palestinian and his home, Palestinian and his uh, farm and his house at times and his relatives. I was living in Beit Hanina and my aunt was living in Bir Nabala and this wall separated between us. We, and it would take us three hours to go to visit. So uh, this is where the wall had its impact. And so uh, reading, reading uh, Yossi's book, first I enjoyed the idea that there is someone on the other side of the wall, although I'm not living on that, on the other, uh, although I'm living on the other side of the wall yet, there, is, there are two walls. There is the cement wall that separates, and there is the psychological wall that also separates. So the, um, what I liked about, about the book was it breaks through, it sends a pigeon with a message to fly over the, not only the cement wall, but also the psychological wall. A wall. And uh, in this way, someone, I saw someone on the other side who is trying hard to reach out. Then I, when I read the text, the, the letters, and I found out maybe it's, it's time for me to correct his narrative or to, or to send my narrative to him so that I don't want to correct it, that I would respect his narrative, but at the same time, 
I would like him to know my narrative. And even and if for him as, a, as an American Jew living in 67, worried about the, the, about the war and about the destruction of Israel by the Arab armies. And on the other side, me as a Palestinian living in Lebanon and uh, looking forward for the war to liberate Palestine and living in this euphoria that we, this is what we have been waiting for 20 years. And then the, I wanted, I read how he felt about what, about that time. I wanted him to, to know how I felt on the other side. And uh, in this way, also to correct some of things that were in the narrative, which I felt uh, contradicted mine. And so I'm very, and throughout my experience when I came back to Jerusalem and throughout my interfaith dialogue with others, whether Christians or Jews, um, I learned many stories and I love to tell stories. And in, uh, and for instance, I love the story of this rabbi where uh, two Jews came to him and uh, uh, to judge uh, regarding a conflict between them. And the first one said uh, his side of the story and the rabbi said to him, you're right. And then the other said this story and the rabbi said to him, you are right. And then after they left, the wife looked at the rabbi and said, but rabbi, how can they both be right? And he said to her, you are also right. So I love that story because it describes the reality of the uh, blind men who were asked to describe the elephant. Or that if I look at a nine from one side, it is a nine. Somebody else look at it from the other side, it's a six. So from there, I looked at the book and I looked at uh, Yossi's letters from that perspective. He's looking at things from his side, and so he's seeing a six. And I'm looking at things from my side, and I'm looking, I'm seeing a nine. So should I tell him about my nine, or should I just let him believe in his six? And so in this way, I thought, no, I would like to tell him, because uh, maybe, maybe any, I wanted to check, is he an open-minded person or is he, is he still living in, in the first book he wrote about why he is a Zionist and about his year, those years. And in this way, I wanted to check him out, uh, scratch from uh, his metal and to see if he really is a speaker or still living in his cave. And so I was very glad to see that, uh, no, he has left the cave. And like I did leave the cave, and both of us met outside the cave. And both of us at that time, we were seeing things from that perspective. And so it is any two things, because unfortunately, within the this conflict, the um, the problem is that like they say that the victim is truth. And so uh, in any conflict. And so the problem is how to revive that victim without uh, insulting the other or without uh, confronting the other. And uh, that's why I felt that it was very important that his message, Yossi's message, uh, reach out to the Palestinians. And uh, I encourage my students to go and read the book and uh, in Arabic and uh, to respond. One of my students responded with 60 pages and I was shocked and at the way she, she did. And then I read it and for her to be living in, a, in the cave and yet still wanting to get out of the cave but is afraid to get, get out because of what impact it will have 
on her relationship with the others living in the cave. And yet she had the courage to write and to say that I don't mind if my letter is published and my voice is heard. And this is uh, who I am and what I am. And so it is so important, I feel, that this narrative uh, be exchanged because we might not have the same narrative and we might not want to have the same narrative. But to you see his narrative and to me my narrative. And let's find the road in between where our narrative that we can meet, where we can meet in the middle, which I call Wasatiya, uh, we can uh, leave out everything which is negative about our narratives and uh, everything that might demonize the other or delegitimize the other or uh, de dehumanize the other. And in this way, we can meet in the middle. And that's our concept with Wasatiya. That's why I started Wasatiya back in 2007, uh, where I'm calling people to come to the middle and meet. And I think that Yossi's book does reflect that, does reflect a message sent to us to have people leave their camps and come to the middle. Because it is true, this is the impact of the Oslo Accords. And in this way, uh, the Oslo Accords, before Oslo, it was Palestinians and Arabs against Jews and the Israelis. After Oslo, it was Palestinians and uh, Israelis for peace against Palestinians and Israelis against peace. And this is where, uh, where the book could reach out, even though there are things we disagree with, yet still it is uh, an important initiative that sends a big message to the Palestinian. There is somebody beyond the wall who is willing to hear your story. Well, Mohammed, I, I so much appreciate um, you and your your perspective and and listening to you, I, I'm thinking back to my own childhood, my own youth, and realizing that you and I have had such similar process of development uh, and we're really mirror images <clears throat> of each other. For me growing up, <clears throat> excuse me, for me growing up, uh, I also saw this conflict as, as right versus wrong, and my side was right. Uh, the Arab side, the Arab world, the Palestinians uh, were trying to destroy us, and, um, and we were right. And uh, now uh, I still, of course, uh, identify as a Zionist, but I don't see uh, this as being a conflict of right versus wrong. I would say as right versus right, <clears throat> and, some, and as sometimes wrong versus wrong as well. <laughs> And, uh, and this notion of both sides having an essential truth that needs to be respected and needs to be heard is really the animating uh, idea of, um, of, of my book. And you know what I learned, Mohammed, in, in speaking to young Palestinians when my book was published, I had, I had meetings and very powerful encounters, as well as the written responses that I received, uh, was um, that in a way this quest, the, the question of this conflict can be boiled down to one question, who started? That's what, that's what Palestinians and Israelis have been arguing about for decades, who started this conflict? And from the Palestinian side or the Arab side generally, the Jews started because we came and we brought the conflict with us. Palestinians were living there and suddenly we show up. From the Jewish perspective, it was the Arab side that started. We didn't just come, we came back to a place that we, we re-indigenized ourselves and 
we always accepted whatever international compromise was being suggested. The Arab world rejected partition, rejected compromise. So their side started. And the way that I understand this today is that each side was acting in the only way that it could based on its history, its narrative, and its understanding. When I think of how Palestinians in the Arab world look at the, looked at the Jews coming back, what they saw was colonialism, European colonialism. And there was no other way that they could see it based on their history, their experience. And what we saw was the next stage, the next enemy against Jewish survival coming from the Palestinian national movement and the Arab world. And, and this perception of, of, of mutual threat, we were playing out our historical nightmares and attributing those to the other side. And instead of really asking ourselves, are the Palestinians really the, the the Nazis for us? Are they really like that kind of enemy? And instead of the Palestinians saying, well, are the Jews really European colonialists when a majority of Israeli Jews actually come from the Middle East? Are refugees from Arab countries, Jews who came from other parts of the Middle East? Is the Jewish story really the same as, as the Crusades? Maybe there's something each of us was missing when we impose the deepest traumas and nightmares of our history onto the other side. And so this conflict is about multiple myths. And I mean, I mean myths not only in terms of illusion, <laughs> but mythos. There, there are very big ideas. There are very big, uh, big emotions, big, big memories that we're, that we're carrying in this conflict. And um, if I could just say one more thing, Mohammed, in response to something for me that was very important that you raised, which was the psychological and emotional dimensions of this conflict. Because in some way, I think that, that, that that's the core. And, and the, the peace talks, the, the, the diplomats always missed those deeper, those deeper layers of, of existential fear on both sides, of a sense of, of deep belonging to this land on both sides. And unless you come to terms with how each people experiences this conflict from within its own narrative, uh, you won't understand what this conflict really is about. So for example, for me, re-encountering re Palestinians after my book came out, especially young Palestinians, and experiencing the despair that they live with, and realizing my side is, is deeply contributing to the despair of a whole generation of Palestinians. And I have to own that. And what I want to explain to Palestinians is that from my side, how we experience this, this conflict is not this great asymmetry of power where we have all the power and the Palestinians have no power. We experience this conflict as, as the Jews alone in a hostile region. We don't only look at Israel versus the Palestinians. Israel versus the Palestinians, we're Goliath and the Palestinians are David. Israel and the region and the balance of power starts to look and feel very different. And the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is caught in the middle of this. And so these are the, the, the elements that I, I, I want to share with Palestinians, that I want Israelis to understand about our neighbors, how they experience this. Never mind the big issues. How, how do you live this conflict? And so the, the fears, the, 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 the deep sense of, of 
outrage that Jews feel that our indigenousness is being denied. The deep sense of outrage that Palestinians feel that we are trampling on their lives. And these are the issues that we have to unpack. And they have to be unpacked with sensitivity, with right versus right. It's the only way you're going to reach, I'll speak for my side, the only way to reach Israelis is if you acknowledge their legitimacy here. If you acknowledge that we have not only le legitimate roots here, but we also have legitimate fears. And, and when you come to Israelis from that place, then you can hear them. And I know that's, that worked with, for me, Muhammad, I can hear things from you that I can't hear from other Palestinians, because you're telling me, I accept you here. You're not a colonialist. You're part of, even though you were born in America, you're part of a people that, that, that has come home and I, and I have to accept that. But what about me, those of us who are here? What do you say to me? And you're challenging me in a way that I have to respond to and not defensively because you're saying, okay, okay, you're here, you did it, you're back. Now what? Now what about me? And you are forcing me to challenge my own people. And the book came out uh, recently in Hebrew. And, uh, and that's what I hope it will do. I hope it's going to help contribute to getting past Israeli fears and, and, and the Israeli defensive position of saying, well, wait a minute, you know, we tried to make peace. We got the second intifada in return, and now it's time for the Palestinian leadership to, uh, to initiate. And my response is, I, I agree with that narrative, but it's not enough. What do we say to the Palestinians? What's, what's the game plan? Where are we heading? Where, 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 where is this going to be 20, 30 years from now? Do we want to still be in this position of ruling another people? I understand our, our existential fears. I share them very deeply. I'm terrified of a Hamas state in the West Bank. That's, that's, that's an Israeli nightmare. But for me, a bigger nightmare is continuing to occupy another people, my neighbors. And that's the dynamic that we have to unpack, but it can only be confronted on the Israeli side from the place that you're coming from, Muhammad, of, of acknowledging the legitimacy of of the Israeli presence here. And I would add the need to acknowledge Israeli fears as a way of allowing Israelis to then acknowledge Palestinian suffering and the injustice that Palestinians are, are living under, that we are causing. Let me um, jump in a second. Thank you both so much. This is extraordinary. And I, we'll, we'll have some time at the end for question and answers and I invite everybody, everybody listening to Put the questions in the in the chat, which Jim quickly is monitoring. But before we stay, and those will lead us back to the more prospective uh, hope. I'm interested uh, if you could take a moment. Uh, the, Archbishop, the Anglican Archbishop of Jerusalem uh, last week talked about the extraordinary pressure that can be brought to bear, essentially, by people on your own team, as it were, from the extremists pressuring a more moderate position to conform. And I know, Mohammed, this has been particularly uh, painful and costly to you, but I wondered if briefly you could each share something of where you've experienced the pressure to conform from the extreme wings of, of, uh, of your own, what you're calling your own side. Would you be willing to do that? Yeah, sure. You see, this is also related to Yossi's point about the question he raised about uh, the uh, the past, I call it the past. I'm not concerned that much with the past, I'm more concerned with the future. And in order to move from the past and the present to the future. And that's where my question will, is how to move ahead. Problem is in trying to move ahead, there are many taboos that have been very well established within the Palestinian uh, society. And as a result, 
we need to break out of that. We need to help them break out of that of those taboos. Uh, but uh, can one do that? And uh, at what risk? And uh, so uh, this is where I believe that uh, the Palestinians want peace, but yet, like the Israelis, they are in state of fear that the other is trying to take them out. And, uh, and as such, this is part of the problem. Now, I went out of the cave and then I came back to the people and I told them, you, 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 are, living, you are seeing perception, you are living in your own dreams, you are living, you are, why don't you see the reality? Why, what is wrong with teaching the Holocaust? What is, go there and see what is happening, what happened, and then decide for yourself. Now, the problem is when, when these ideas are so entrenched, and it is not only entrenched in uh, the educational system, which does not teach about the other. On the contrary, that teaches it was the Jews who killed, who poisoned the prophet, or teaches anti-Jewish stories, or teaches the uh, misperceptions, uh, misinterpretations uh, of the Quran, or misquote or wrong quotations for the prophet to call for anti-Jewish uh, feeling or to incite anti-Semitism. This is where when you come and say this is wrong and this is not what you should be teaching the children. And for instance, we teach our children poetry. Instead of teaching them love poetry, then we teach them the poetry of anger and death. And for instance, uh, one of the most famous poems is that we teach our children and so popular is that I will take my uh, soul, I will take my soul and throw it in the face of death, either a life that pleases a friend or a death that angers the enemy. So my answer is which death angers the enemy or teases the enemy? Death will, your death will please the enemy. And to, to teach these children that they should die and in their death, they will tease the enemy or unplease the enemy. And this is on the contrary. And you are teaching him to die and then the enemy will be happy because there's nobody there from the other side. Or you know, when you have the flag made out of four colors, one representing green pasture, one representing white, which is good deeds, but one representing the color of blood and to say that we are proud that blood is shed on our swords of the enemy or that our battles are black because we killed so many of the enemies. What type of teaching, what type of generation are you bringing up? And so when you come and tell them that, they get, instead of reviewing what you are saying and hearing what you are saying, they attack you personally and claim, and claim then that you are a traitor or collaborator or whatever. And this is where to move away from the crowd when the crowd is walking towards the abyss is really something that needs a lot of uh, any moments to think about it, whether really you want to go away from that safety that you belong, when you belong to the crowd, to walk out and feel the cold of being alone there outside the crowd. And so uh, this is where even with my students, when I took them to Auschwitz, my message to them, I said, I brought you here, not to brainwash you or to convince you or anything, but to help you see. Now that you see, decide for yourself. So when a student asked me, what did this sign Arbeit macht frei mean? 
she, I told her to go find out. And then she bought this book from the bookstore there at the museum. And in it, it said, uh, those who went, uh, the commander of the camp was welcoming the people by saying, greeting them by saying, all you enter here, abandon hope for the only way out is through the chimneys of the crematorium. And so this woman who was nine years in Israeli jail at that moment, she had an awakening moment that this is not a work camp. And if you work, you can get out. This is a death camp in which you are not going out. And so when a student came to me and said, why are we learning about the Holocaust when Israelis do not teach about the Nakba and uh, consider raising a flag illegal? I said, simply because you are doing the right thing. And so this is where we can learn from each other and we can learn from the wisdom of the old generations. And that's why I believe we should not teach our children what our ancestors taught us. Our ancestors taught us to hate, to love death, to love uh, to, uh, to be filled with anger. No, we should teach our children to be filled with love, with compassion, with mercy, with empathy. And this is where I believe we can have a better generation for, for Palestinians. And uh, that's why you should scratch what we have learned and try to uh, work on something, on a new narrative, on a new way of thinking, on a new way of living and to honor life, not death. And this is our religion. And if we go back to the values of our religion, whether we are Muslims, Christians, or Jews, these are the values that we share, to value life, to value uh, compassion, to do unto others what you want them to do to you, and uh, to uh, be able to live in an neighborly way. That's exactly why the symbolism of Yossi's title of Letters to My Neighbor fits in within this framework of building peace and building compromise and building. And that's why my message to my students uh, when I'm going to give them that lecture about uh, uh, justice and reconciliation is no, don't. Uh, don't look for justice because it doesn't exist. And if you want to work for peace, don't work for justice. Because what is justice to me as a Palestinian? What is justice to Yossi or to any, to any other Jew? And uh, on the contrary, because in justice, you have to take like what Yossi, Yossi was doing now is that about issue versus issue. And, and then to have documents and to who started the war, who is to blame, or we have to put that behind us and to seek peace by embracing what the other believes or what the other point or the other case by embracing both, both cases, my case and this case. So it is not being pro-Israel or pro-Palestine, but being pro-peace, pro-reconciliation. And in this way, we are pro-Israel and pro-Palestine. It is a difficult road to take and Palestinians and many Israelis so far, as indicated by the elections, have not yet accepted that. Whether it is the second intifada, whether it is uh, political leaders who are not honest and are not really telling the truth about what situation is or whatever, there are complex factors, but we have to break that. We have to break the silence. We have to move on and to think in terms of the future rather than the past. And uh, to think how, what needs to be done in order for us to build a better future for our generation. We have inherited this conflict from our grandparents. We would like to leave behind a legacy of peace. That's the point. Thank you so much. Yossi, would you care to respond? Yeah, you know, you know when you're asking uh, about the price that each of us has paid 
in dealing with the extremists in, in our respective camps. Uh, Mohammed is the hero here. Uh, he's the one who's paid uh, a very high personal price, who stood up to, to violence and intimidation. Um, by comparison, I, I really have not experienced anything like that. Uh, occasionally some discomfort, some, uh, some taunting, but it's, it's, there's <laughs> really, uh, uh, I have not paid a price. And, and in Israeli society uh, so far, and I don't know if, if it's going to continue this way, I'm worried about, about where things are heading politically, but in Israeli society so far, uh, it's still within the realm of, uh, of, of accepted, tolerated discourse to, uh, to, to offer the positions that I'm offering. It's, it's not considered uh, beyond the pale yet. There are signs. There are signs that, are, that really worry me. And um, if the Netanyahu government, if, if the Netanyahu coalition comes back to power, I'm very afraid for Israel's future. Um, right now, I think we have a government that, uh, you know, it's the first uh, Arab Jewish government, first coalition in Israel's history. There are, there are many problems with this government, but um, it, it is in, in, in other ways, a really a remarkable achievement in, in the range, not only to bring Arabs and Jews, Arab citizens of Israel and, and Jewish citizens of Israel together in the same government, but left and right and center, it's, it's, it's quite a, a, a remarkable achievement. It's not very stable and it may not last. Uh, in terms of, um, of where I see the problems coming from in Israeli society, um, it isn't so much the educational system, although there are problems, especially in the religious educational system about what is taught there about Islam and Palestinians. Uh, in the secular school system, I would say not much is taught at all, but uh, I don't think that there's a negative uh, education there. It's more, the problem tends to be more in the religious community. But generally, I, I see the, the, the problem coming from, from some of our politicians, uh, a, um, a real incitement uh, coming from, uh, from the right, from, from elements of the far right, um, which is rel relatively new in Israeli politics. You know, we, uh, this is in this last election, we've had, uh, we now have a, uh, it's still a small party, but it is a far right, and I would say, frankly, racist party, uh, the party of Smotrich and Ben Gvir. They now have uh, six seats out of 120. That's still small, but the polls show them growing, and they're popular among young people. And here's what worries me most of all, is that in Israeli society, the younger you go, the more anger and hatred you'll find. And and I don't know, Muhammad, if you feel the same uh, in Palestinian society, but the despair among young Israelis is much greater than in my generation. My generation was the generation of a failed peace process, but we had the hope at a certain point that something might change. It was the possibility. And I remember the, the Oslo signing on the White House lawn as this moment of, of great hope. And my children grew up in an Israel that lost hope. They grew up after the failure of the peace process. And they grew up with the only relationship to Palestinians being terrorism, uh, violence. That's their, that's my, not my children particularly, thank God, but, but their generation. Uh, I, um, I knew Palestinians. I mean, I was able to go on that journey into Palestinian society in the late 1990s. I went into mosques. Today, that's inconceivable. And an Israeli Jew could not do the journey that I undertook, first of all, for physical reasons, issues of safety and emotional reasons. When, when you know, Mohammed, when you spoke about the, the, the concrete physical wall and the metaphorical wall, uh, we're all carrying that wall in our heads to one extent or another. And I deeply worry about this next generation of Israelis who don't have a living encounter 
with Palestinians. And my generation did. It wasn't an equal encounter, but there were human encounters. And that's gone now. So um, the, other, the other point that I'd like to, to just, just respond very brief, briefly to what you talked about, um, about the need to, to recognize that there is, um, that there's not justice. Uh, my, my, my qualification there would be, I would just put in the word absolute justice. There's no absolute justice for either side. This is a con a, in a conflict between right and right, each side is going to have a wrong imposed on them. And neither side is going to be able to fulfill what it regards as, as, its, as its full rights. Um, when Palestinians tell me that Jaffa and Haifa uh, belong to Palestine, my response is, you're right. You know, it is all part of the land of Palestine. But Hebron and Bethlehem are part of the land of Israel, from my point of view. And so between the river and the sea, there are two conceptual territories that happen to be the same territory. There's the land of Palestine and the land of Israel. And it's all one. And that's the tragedy here. And you speak to the Israeli right, and they'll say there's no more justice than that all of this little land uh, is ours. There's a, we have only one little corner of sovereignty on the planet. There are 55 or 56 Muslim states. And then speak to a Palestinian and say, well, what do I care if there are 55 Muslim states? This is my, my land. And between the river and the sea, this is all mine. And so absolute justice is, means absolute justice for one side and absolute injustice for another. And the way that I, that I write about this in, in the letters book is that what's required is not only a partition of the land, but a partition of our concept of justice. And we're going to need to share justice. And if one side or the other insists on absolute justice for their side, then you know that that's leading to absolute injustice for the other. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Jim and some got some really interesting questions. Um, <clears throat> um, but as I do, uh, I'd like you to bear in mind that you're talking into a conversation that's taking place within our denomination in the United States about um, whether or not to, to whether or not Israel should be named an apartheid state. Um, that's not front and center to our conversation today, but that's that's in that's in the background. Uh, I'd be very happy uh, if we would address that question. I will go for it. Yes, please. I, um, I think that one could say many things about what's gone wrong in Israel. Uh, I don't think apartheid uh, is one of them. It could, it could become that, but I live in a, um, in a building. Um, in the French Hill neighborhood in, in Jerusalem, that is almost 50% Arab Israeli, 50% Jewish Israeli. My next door neighbor, my upstairs neighbor, uh, are Palestinian citizens of Israel. Uh, I ride the light rail train to work. Uh, at rush hour, you have Palestinians uh, and Israelis um, pressed against each other. Um, apartheid is not what I would regard as, as this experience. Apartheid means racial separation. And, um, and Mohammed made the point that the wall also separates Palestinians from Palestinians. Uh, my Palestinian Israeli neighbors look out at the wall from the same side that I do. We're looking at the, at the wall from west to east. And we're on the same side of that wall, not emotionally, but physically. And to put the apartheid label on Israel has one result and only one result. It takes, it makes Israelis like me go mad with rage. 
And my response when I see one mainline denomination after another take up the apartheid uh, mantra is to say, well, I'm finished with you. Uh, my first question, when I, when I meet Presbyterians, a minister, or when I, if I'm invited to speak to a Presbyterian congregation, my first question is, where do you stand on all the resolutions your church has passed about Israel? I want to know where you, where you personally stand, because if you stand there, I have no interest in dialoguing with you. I'm not interested in dialoguing with you about whether I have a right to exist or not, whether I am a criminal, whether not what I do is wrong, but what I am is wrong. I'm not interested in that conversation. And so I really hope, uh, for personal reasons as well, because I have a very close Episcopalian family. Uh, I, I, have, I love the Episcopalian church. I've spoken in, in, in Episcopalian frameworks. I've preached Sunday morning in an Episcopalian church. Uh, it means a lot to me for really personal reasons. Um, I really hope that, uh, that uh, the church doesn't go there. Um, in terms of the consequences, the apartheid conversation is a great gift to the Israeli right, because what it does is allow the Israeli right to tell the Israeli public, do you see what they're saying about us? Are we an apartheid state? Is that what your daily experience of life in this country is? And any, almost any Israeli Jew certainly will say, this is ludicrous, this is, this is a big lie, or to use a term from Jewish history, it's a blood libel. And that's the term that Israelis use when we refer to this. And, and the old, the old Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I wanted to, I thought you finished. Sorry. Ah, no, so I just, one last line is that um, what this does is emp further empower the Israeli right by saying, look, you know, you know what they think about us, they being the non-Jewish world. And it, we're on our own here and we have to dig in because this is about survival. And, um, and that's, um, that's the gift that all of this apartheid conversation uh, could, that's the big contribution. It'll make people feel good. You know, you're voting for justice and that's great. Uh, but your contribution to, to this conflict will be to empower the people in my society that I'm trying to push back against. Uh, actually the term apartheid is a South is coined for South Africa. And it doesn't fit at all when we are talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict or Palestinian situation. And it is like uh, demonizing the other. You are bankrupt. You cannot argue. You cannot talk. And so you tell the other you are a kafir. Or you tell the other you are a traitor. Or you tell Israel you are apartheid. But rather, when you look at it, so there is no apartheid here because I'm Palestinian. I enjoy coffee in an Israeli coffee shop where he serves me or she serves me without looking at what is my color, what is who I am, but rather I'm a customer. And, um, and so it does not fit. There are two types of Palestinians under Israeli rule. One, are the, uh, one are the Palestinians labeled as Palestinians Israelis who are citizens of Israel, yet of Arab descent, Arab heritage. And the other are the Palestinians in the West Bank, Jer East Jerusalem and Gaza who are under occupation. Now, I think that when you use the term apartheid, instead of occupation regarding one or the other, then uh, you are uh, straying away from the struggle to end the occupation. Because in Israel, for the Israeli, Palestinian Israeli, who has citizenship, there are laws, there are thousands of laws to his benefit. There are 60 laws who discriminate against him. And he has the right as a citizen to fight them, whether in the Knesset or to change that law, like what happened recently when an Arab Israeli refused to vote for a law 
and so it is so it can be changed. This did not take place in apartheid South Africa. With the other Palestinians in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, our problem is not apartheid. It's not the laws against us. It is the occupation. And on the contrary, when, when we label this apartheid, we are, we are uh, moving the struggle away in the wrong direction. And that's why we in Wasatiya are against BDS because BDS looks at Israel as one unit and says, let's boycott Israel. But there are, within Israel, there are people who are for peace, people who are against peace. Why are you boycotting the people for peace and who are defending you or standing by you or are helping you? And in this way, to make it all one in one bundle, that's totally wrong because we need the peace camp in Israel to grow again and to be empowered in order for them to help us in our cause. Otherwise, we will never achieve our objective. And so in this way, I believe this terminology of uh, apartheid. Also, when the Palestinian, there is also the term normalization. If you are like what I was accused of normalization, as if it is a treason. And it, it was said that normalization is treason. You committed treason. But I asked him, what does normalization mean? Aren't you normalizing when you are going to get your ID from an Israeli or to get a permit or to buy from Israel, uh, Israeli goods or to use the Israeli shekel? And isn't that normalization? And uh, so, so this is also another part of the conflict. People do not understand the meaning of the terms. And as a result, they use them uh, like uh, uh, labels. So apartheid, Israel is apartheid. Uh, Anti-normalization is treason. They don't understand what apartheid means. They don't understand what normalization mean. I, I ask them, what is your what is your goal? What is your aim? Is it war? You have lived for you have lived 70 years uh, in, in war. What did you achieve? Nothing. You got your land more confiscations, you got people killed, you got you lost property. So what is the goal? Peace? If you want peace, then you have to normalize. You have to discuss and go back to your religion. It says that if you, in the Quran, that if the other leans towards peace, lean down towards peace. And also, and this is part of the dialogue. Uh, in the Quran, it says, and have with them a soft dialogue. In, in the best of ways, argue with them in the best of ways. So here, this is also, I think, like what Yossi said, that to use the term uh, uh, apartheid is not in good intentions. And to start from there, you are starting on the wrong direction. And I believe that it should not, the term should not be even used. It does not apply. It does not mean the same thing. And on the contrary, it alienates the other from joining the peace camp. Thank you so much. Over to you, Jim. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. It may well be that that uh, Jeffrey and I and others need to find a way to, to uh, share the recording um, with 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 many of our our friends who will be talking about that very question um, at the general convention in July, because. I think people will uh, learn um, immensely from both Yossi's and um, Muhammad's take on this particular issue. Um, Yossi, I am I am one of the ones that read at the entrance to the Garden of of Eden. Um, you, know the, you know the writer's joke. Oh, you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> I am one of the ones. I, it was recommended to me um, 
by my mentor, Ellen Davis, who you may have come across. Oh, sure, sure. I know Ellen. And reading that book uh, changed the way um, I understand my own place um, as a religious professional, which is me dancing around, not really wanting to say it changed the way I understand God, but it, it did, and certainly other religions. I think I'm, I'm saddened in a way to hear that you're in a much different place now, and maybe everyone else in the room um, is also somewhat saddened. And I'm, I'm interested, um, I'm interested, Muhammad, if you could take a couple of minutes. Um, um, Yossi, you said the younger you go, the deeper the despair. That's a paraphrase about, about what you're seeing happening to the younger generation of, of Israelis. Can you say a little more about, about that in terms of how young is young? And then, and then I'm wondering, um, Muhammad, if you can um, share with us um, whether in your experience, you're becoming more hopeful or, or more pessimistic the way I think I'm hearing uh, Yossi. So over to you both. And and by the way, uh, this is this is a this is such a gift to us. So thank you, thank you both. Um, Mohammed, would you like to respond first? Um, why don't you? And then I will respond. Do you want me to go first? Okay. So I uh, so I I just Jim, I just want to tell you how moved I I am by by your words and how grateful I am. Uh, now, when um, when you write and you send something out. Uh, you really don't know if you're going to 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 reach anyone, and and uh, and this book was a um, a difficult experience on several levels, uh, and um, and so I, I'm really grateful to you uh, for for what you've said. Uh, I you know one of the the gifts that I I received from this process of writing the letters to my Palestinian neighbor book was allowing me to reclaim the previous book and uh, and and having these um these relationships especially the friendship that muhammad and i have and and people can see this by the way we we documented it uh, in a film uh we made a, a short film uh three five uh five minute segments uh, uh the first two segments each one is about our story and then the third segment actually records the moment when we met. And uh, it's, uh, it's available, uh, it's called, I think it's called Neighbors, and it's available on the website of the book. The website is called letterstomyneighbor.com. Uh, there's an Arabic and an English section. You go into the English and go into the videos, and you'll see these three five-minute segments uh, that's called Neighbors. And so, the the our friendship uh, allowed me to reclaim the hope of the Garden of Eden book, and uh, and that was really a retroactive process. So, um, uh, in terms of your question about about how young I mean, uh, high school students. My son um, works um, with um, an NGO that brings. Um, Arab Israeli, Jewish Israeli kids together uh, to play soccer. They have 8,000 kids all around uh, Israel, Arab towns, Jewish towns. And he comes back from these, these matches with, with terrible stories about violence. And, uh, and, um, and the violence is not just soccer violence. It's, it's, it's tinged, there's hatred. And uh, he is really worried about what he sees happening among high school kids on, on both sides. But uh, I'm concerned, I, 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 own, I own the Jewish side of this. That's, that's, my, that's my particular problem. And, um, and so the younger you get, the worse it's getting. I just had a conversation a couple hours ago with, with one of the fellows here at the Hartman Institute where I sit 
And he said, you know, we have all of these programs and they're, they're great, but we're not talking to young Israelis. They're not hearing our, our, our vision of Israel. And what do we do? How do we create this language? And so there's this growing sense of desperation uh, among Israeli liberals about what we're losing a generation. Uh, uh, yesterday, I was in a meeting uh, in which it was about the curriculum. It was a Palestinian uh, uh, session. Um, and then in, in that meeting, I was shocked to hear a young man object to the use of coexistence between Palestinians and Israelis in Jerusalem and saying that there is no coexistence. And uh, I was very shocked because he works for an Israeli company and he has been taught in Israeli university. And yet he says there should be no existence. And this reminded me last year, I was asked to teach a course at David Yalin College on reconciliation. And the idea was the first, the first uh, time that it will be for Palestinian students. And then the second time it will be for Palestinian and Israeli students. So by the time the course was over, then the university, the school, the college, which is for teachers, uh, said that they are sorry, they cannot uh, continue with that program. And that's why, and they said that students objected to, to the course and the content of the course. And I said, what did they object to? Well, and they said, why don't you meet the students and talk? And I met the students, they were 18 students. And, uh, you know, there were three and or four vocal uh, among them who said, we do not want reconciliation. This is treason. Well, what type of reconciliation with our enemies? Our people are in prison. These people took our land. These people, and I was shocked. And the others were silent. I asked them to speak and they said, no, no, let them, yeah, and let these few people uh, say, reflect our views. But I'm sure that these were not their views. You know, and I was shocked because these students will be teachers and they are in David Yelin, which is an Israeli school to, te to teach teachers. And so to have these people and the school, instead of having these students, two or three of them being uh, in, uh, talked to or, or uh, discussed with, they followed their step and canceled the whole program on reconciliation. And uh, it gave me despair, not because of what the students said, but because of what the school did, that they would cancel a program on reconciliation because there are few who reject to reconciliation, particularly that these students will become teachers tomorrow. And that's why we, are we have done that work in uh, uh, Flensburg, where we had this European Wasatiya graduate school for reconciliation and peace in order to bring in away from their cave, to bring people there, Palestinian or Israelis, to teach them about empathy, about uh, tolerance, about interfaith dialogue, about conflict resolution, about reconciliation, about moderation, so that once they study away from the cave, they can come back and teach the others and be leaders within the community. And so that's where I'm very worried about the younger generation, that it, it could be influenced by the, by the extremists and uh, that nothing is being done to, to bring awareness to this generation that where Hamas is becoming stronger and stronger in the West Bank, particularly with the weakening of Fatah and uh, the corruption and misgovernance that's taking place. 
and as a result, and this is part of the problem we are facing, that we need to empower the moderates within Israel and within Palestine, so they can stand up against, you know, the other day, there was the march of the uh, flags. More than 50 Israeli uh, young people walked in that, carrying 50, 000, the flag. 50, 50, Sorry, 50,000 Israelis walked in there, uh, carrying the Israeli flags to assert that this land is ours, okay? And so uh, what's interesting is that uh, there was a young man, a young Palestinian, who had put the flag on a drone, a Palestinian flag on a drone, and then made that fly over all of them. And so to me, that was a very inspiring moment. Why? Because I thought that young man is creative enough. He did not take his knife and to go and fight them. He did not put a belt and go and blow them up. He did not go for violence, but he was creative in sending a message that peacefully we are here. And so put that flag on that drone and made it fly over, over their heads. And they're looking at it uh, surprised. So this is what we need our youth to think, to do for the future. The way to ha have them think that way, to, to think in terms of finding solutions within peace, within creativity, in, with, uh, innovation, using innovation, technology, and all that. And that's how we will get out of the hole in which we are in. Thank you, uh, Mohammed. I know that uh, Yossi and a number of us have another, another appointments coming up and we want to honor, honor the time and we're right at the limit. We've had some fantastic questions in the chat. We just can't do the complexity of the whole situation in, in 90 minutes, but questions about Iran and what we can learn. So thank you to all of you who have participated. Um, as we are enjoined in our own scriptures, let's close by praying for the peace of Jerusalem. This prayer was written uh, for a different context, but it works well for us today. Let us pray. Eternal God, creator of the universe, there is no God but you. Great and wonderful are your works, wondrous are your ways. Thank you for the many splendid variety of your creation. Thank you for the many ways we affirm your presence and your purpose and the freedom to do so. Forgive our violation of your creation. Forgive our violence and hatred toward each other. We stand in awe and gratitude for your persistent love for each and all of your children, Christian, Jew, Muslim, as well as those of other faiths. Grant to all and our leaders attributes of the strong, mutual respect in words and deed, restraint in the exercise of power, and the will for peace for all. Eternal God, creator of the universe, there is no God but you. Amen. 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 Grateful thanks to each and every thank one. You. Go in peace. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all so for much. For inviting us and thank you for being here, for coming, attending. Thank you. Thank God, be, God be with us all.